spinal cord injury is one of the greatest survivable catastrophes experienced by humans. Dr. Marcel Dvorak is an expert on spine injuries. He's a professor who is head of the academic division of Spine Department of Orthopedics at UBC. He is a surgeon who was recently appointed as a scientific director at the Rick Hansen Institute. And it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Marcel Dvorak to Studio 4 to tell us more. And that does not mean you operate at the Rick Hansen Institute. No, correct, Fanny. More like the Vancouver General Hospital. The Vancouver General. The, the Rick Hansen Institute's on the site of the Vancouver General Hospital, and it's sort of two buildings over from where the helicopters land and, you know, bring a lot of our injured patients in. So it's great to get all those researchers mm. in the same environment that the patients are in, because really that's, that's the link that we're trying to make between the patients that have the problems and the researchers that can hopefully help them find solutions. And you a busy doctor. Why did you decide to be part of uh, the registry, the Rick Hansen uh, Institute? Well, we all look at individual patients, and, and you know, when we see individual patients injured, we can do things to help those individuals, but we're, we're limited in what we can do. So, you know, we can fix the spinal column, we can take out discs, we can fuse segments, we can recreate stability of the spine. But when it comes to the cord itself, the nerves, we're, we're a little bit stymied in what we can do. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're looking for ways of improving the care of spinal cord injured patients, trying to get recovery back, trying to optimize the regeneration of the cord. And to do that, we need to work in an environment where um, we can access a large number of patients, where we can collect data from patients. One of my old teachers told me years ago, he said, um, if you look at the patient carefully enough, they have the answer to the problem. And I think that's true. So that if we study patients and ask them questions about, you know, what they're experiencing, what their sensation, what their movement, what their problems are, then, you know, the answer is buried somewhere in there. What determines the severity of a spinal cord injury? Uh, uh, some are yeah. called paraplegic, some quadriplegic. Right. What's happening in the cent central nervous system in the spine? Sure, so, so it's very analogous to the, the wire coming into your house and going to the central breaker panel. And the, the breaker panel is the brain. And then there's, there's a large cable coming out of that, which is the spinal cord. And from the spinal cord at different levels, there are nerves that go out and, and they influence everything from your cranial nerves to how your face moves, how your eyes work, ears work, down through your arms. And so a quadriplegic will lose function in their arms. A very high quadriplegic, you know, like, uh, like Superman, Christopher Reeve, may mm -hmm. even lose the ability to breathe lower levels of injury farther down the cable can affect just the legs. And the very lowest level of injury can affect the bowel, bladder, sexual function, that lowest part of the spinal cord. And then the, you know, the severity of the injury itself is the second variable. So a very high energy injury from a car accident where you're thrown out of the car, you know, those can be very serious mm -hmm. injuries without much potential for recovery. Whereas a fall at home, uh, you know, in an elderly person, which is an increasingly common uh, type of spinal cord injury, can have tremendous potential for recovery. And how do you determine and how soon do you determine how serious the injury is, whether you fall at home or you're in yeah. a severe car accident? Uh, is, is it yeah. the uh, amount of the cord that's severed or what? Yeah. Well, that's one of the things that's changed tremendously in the last 20 years. So we now have imaging like the MRI scans mm. where we can see the actual cord, we can see the nerves, and we can see even components within the spinal cord. And we can measure the amount of damage done to the cord, the amount of compression of the cord. Very few cords are severed. Um, you know, maybe 5% of spinal cord injuries are, are, are from an actual physical transection of the cut cord. Cut in half. So cut you don't half. die when it's cut in half, no, necessarily. No, you don't. You don't. You, you lose all movement and feeling below that level, mm -hmm. but you're not going to die from that. Um, many spinal cord injuries occur just as a result of a bruise. If, if we're operating on a spinal cord, uh, you know, it doesn't take much to injure that cord. 
um, a, a small bruise from a bone fragment going back or a small bruise from the spinal cord being kinked or pinched in an arthritic spine, those are all things that can cause a, a very severe spinal cord injury that may look indistinguishable from someone with a completely severed cord. When you go into the operating room and work on a spinal cord, yes. <laughs> what's the procedure? It must be extremely delicate, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Equipment-wise, well, the equipment has changed dramatically. You know, 20 years ago, we used to put people in traction and mm -hmm. we'd put them on bed rest, we'd put them in halos, you know, because we were terrified of operating on the spine because it's so delicate and you don't want to do damage. But the things that have changed is our anesthesia is better. Our anesthetists can give better anesthetics that give better blood supply to the cord, make it safer for us to operate. Our imaging is better, so the MRI shows us exactly where we need to be. And our surgical techniques are better. We can do micro-surgical techniques where very atraumatically we can take pressure off the cord and do it in a very safe way. And we've just completed some research that's shown that even if you operate in the first hours after a spinal cord injury, you can do it safely without making the cord injury worse. And in fact, there may be a benefit to operating early mm. as far as the patient's recovery is concerned. And in the olden days, like yes. 10 years ago, 20 yeah. years ago, yeah. spinal cord injury, uh, what's changed uh, dramatically? Uh, the research, yeah. the stem cell research, yeah. what? That uh, gives uh, patients hope, that gives you hope. Right. Well, Fanny, I think the big thing that I see is as I said, 20 years ago, we were very hesitant to operate on the spinal column, the bones and discs, because we didn't really have good techniques, good instruments, good imaging, or good anesthetic techniques. Mm -hmm. Now, I think there's been an absolute breakthrough. We can stabilize, we can take the pressure off an injured cord, and we can create the ideal environment around that spinal cord mm -hmm. to allow it to heal and recover. The thing that we can't do is we can't yet influence that cord itself and get it to regenerate any faster than it's just going to do on its own. And that's the next big hurdle. That's where things like stem cells and neuroprotective agents, drugs, blood pressure modification, all sorts of all sorts of investigations that we're, we're looking at now. That's going to be the next big hurdle is, uh, is influencing the I'm nerves. sure. Gene therapy, stem cell therapy, and now that yeah. uh, George Bush is no longer in the White House, <laughs> there, <laughs> there seems to be a little more research and there, stem cell research. Yeah. Is it embryonic stem cells, skin stem, you know, there's many kinds. Sure. Well, you know, I don't know. Right. Well, mm -hmm. there are all sorts of kinds, and, and I think we, we shouldn't be blinded by the um, the actual political debates. Uh, I think the mm. scientific uh, evidence is that there are very many adult-derived stem cells that are void of any mm -hmm. ethical concerns that are extremely promising. And, and one of the big ones actually comes out of nerve cells from your, from your nose. And they're stem cells, olfactory and sheathing cells. So they're skin-derived stem cells, they're, they're blood-derived stem cells. So there are a number of stem cells that are very, very promising, but they're probably only a part of the solution. They're not the whole answer right. to that. And if they are your stem cells, is it likely the body is more likely to accept them than if, if they're somebody else's or Absolutely. in a Petri dish or Absolutely. something? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. How yeah. fascinating, because if they could take a stem cell, now listen to me yes. postulating, a stem cell out of your nerve up here, your nose, and right. put it in your spine, and you right. walked again, that would be a good thing. That would be a good thing. A bit of a stretch. Yeah. A, a bit of a stretch, mm -hmm. but within the realm of, of uh, stuff that's being looked at in, mm -hmm. in the lab. What yeah. about injuries to the spine, uh, 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 sports injuries, for instance, right. uh, on the ice? Yes. Playing hockey, getting hit in the NFL, getting a rugby injury. Yeah. Well, I think there's been a lot more attention on prevention of mm -hmm. those injuries, and I think that's all good. But despite the prevention, you know, you can wear helmets, you can wear all sorts of body armor, but still your neck is very vulnerable. And this goes for skiers, snowboarders, it goes for hockey players, it goes for any sort of contact or high-speed, high-velocity sport. 
And so despite all of these uh, attempts to minimize the risk, there still is a substantial mm -hmm. risk. And we're seeing substantial numbers of injuries that we never saw before. For example, mountain bikers. So, you know, we thought the summer would be our quiet time mm. and we'd be busy during the winter with skiers and snowboarders, mm -hmm. but lo and behold, with, with bike parks and people more aggressively mountain biking at higher speeds and doing more on their bikes, we're seeing, you know, more neck injuries and, and right. back injuries, some of them, unfortunately, you know, catastrophic right. spinal cord injuries. Yes, if you flip off a mountain bike uh, in a perfect world, where do you want to land? Not on your head. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, I, I know what you mean. Uh, sometimes with great athletes, they say, yes. if you are going to take a header or whatever, yes. try and land like this or put your arms yeah. a certain way, that kind of thing. And I know it's not predictable when you fall off your mountain bike. I mean, the, the, you're absolutely right. I, I've always thought that a klutz like me coming off a mountain mm -hmm. bike would be a very bad thing. And I you're do something You're a surgeon and you call yourself well, a klutz. Physically. Well, you have some other skills. <laughs> I guess so. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I think there is a benefit to being athletic and being able to roll through a fall or know how to fall. Mm. But the interesting thing is we're seeing these injuries occur in people of every level of expertise. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing it in, you know, in world champion downhill sure. mountain bikers, but we're also seeing it in the recreational uh, athlete who's riding, uh, you know, north of Squamish and hits a log and goes over his bike. Yes. So, so it's the full spectrum, unfortunately. And how important is it to get to that person immediately as far as uh, recovery, yeah. resilience, yeah. Uh, surgery? Well, one of the studies we're, we're doing has shown exactly that that not only is your outcome from your spinal cord injury better the earlier you get treatment, mm -hmm. so that your neurologic recovery can be much right. improved. For example, you know, someone like Mike Harcourt, he was flown right to the hospital, he went right through CTMR, he was in the operating room that night, and you know, we were able to decompress the cord very quickly and he's had an excellent outcome. He's had excellent yes. recovery. So there is that time dependent nature. Mm -hmm. But the other, the flip side of it is that your complications, the problems that you get, some of them are associated with a spinal cord injury. Some of them are just from being in a hospital or mm -hmm. being you know, immobilized. Those are much fewer and much less the earlier you're treated. Okay. And, uh, it, my mother always said, don't know yes. if she knew, yes. if, if you're helping somebody who's in a car accident that's flown out of the car, do not yes. move them. I think that's good Is advice. Is that still good advice? I think that's good advice. Because Cover them with a blanket, do not move them. There's so, I mean, unless there's some sort of immediate peril, like, right. the like fire, fire or <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> explosions right. or things. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that's very good advice. There's so many really well-trained paramedics, and they're all right. so close. I mean, the geography of our, our, our province is such that, you know, you can be in a remote area, but usually mm -hmm. even then you mm -hmm. can get a paramedic mm -hmm. fairly quickly. Dr. Marcel Dvorak he is with us. He's a spine surgeon, uh, coastal health researcher, uh, professor, full professor, and we'll come back and talk more about the Rick Hansen Institute and the coordination that it takes around the world. Yes. Because they're researching in Austria and they're researching here. And when you put that all together in the database, that's got to help you. It will. Okay. We'll come back.